welcome into episode 105 of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. And I'm August Trometer. You are still the product, your kids are the byproduct, and a look at how it's going for DuckDuckGo. Once more, unto The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. No doubt you've heard it before. In fact, I think you've probably heard it on this show before. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Well, it turns out if you are paying for the product, you may still be the product. From a lengthy, lengthy piece in Bloomberg, for the past year, select Google advertisers have had access to a potent new tool to track whether the ads they ran online led to a sale at a physical store in the U.S., That insight came thanks in part to a stockpile of MasterCard transactions that Google paid for. Here's what we're talking about. In May 2017, the company introduced store sales measurement. It had two components. The first lets companies with personal information on consumers, like encrypted email addresses, upload those into Google's system and synchronize ad buys with offline sales. The second injects card data. It works like this, according to Bloomberg. A person searches for red lipstick on Google, clicks on an ad, surfs the web, but doesn't buy anything. Later, they walk into a store and buy red lipstick with their MasterCard. The advertiser who ran the ad is fed a report from Google listing the sale along with other transactions in a column that reads, Offline Revenue, only if the web surfer is logged into a Google account online and made the purchase within 30 days of clicking on the ad. The advertisers are given a bulk report with a percentage of shoppers who clicked or viewed an ad then made a relevant purchase. MasterCard spokesman said the company does not view data on the individual items purchased inside stores. It's not an exact match, but it's the most powerful tool Google, the world's largest ad seller, has offered for shopping in the real world. Marketers once had a patchwork of consumer data in their hands to triangulate who saw their ads and who was prompted to spend. Now... They had far more clarity. Now, the I keep using bad words. I don't want to say weird. I don't want to say scary. I don't want to say troubling. Uh, but I'm going to go with troubling because I looked, you know, for a while, August, for just the right word. <laughs> Am I right in thinking that the troubling part of all of this is the secret deal? I mean, we know that Google knows more than we think. And obviously, we know that our credit card companies know what we're buying I mean, to me, it's the two of them talking that's troubling, especially without us knowing. What are your thoughts? I'll use a word. This is terrifying. Uh (laughs) Okay. See, terrifying wasn't one of the ones that I thought of. That's a good word. It's a good word. It scares the bejeepers out of me. It really does. Uh, and, And really... This is the holy grail of advertising. Mm-hmm. Uh, back back before the internet, you know, you would you would throw an ad on TV, and if your sales went up for that product, then the ad was working, and if sales didn't go up, then it wasn't working. And that's all advertisers had to work with. When the internet came along, and you could count clicks and all of that stuff, uh, then they wanted metrics for everything. And so, this is a great way for an advertiser to have a metric on whether or not, you know, something online is working for them in store. The scary part comes when, you know, sure, they say that it's in bulk and they say it's just percentages and they say they're not looking at product lists and they say that it's anonymized and they can say all kinds of things, but that's today. And tomorrow what's going to happen is, and you know, Target is a perfect example of this. You go into a Target and let's say you've got somebody who needed you to pick up diapers. Uh, you've just got a friend who calls you and says, hey, I need you to pick up some diapers. Can you can you go grab them and, and bring them over? And so you run to Target, you grab the diapers, you buy them with a credit card, and you take them home. Well, now all of a sudden Target has you, uh, because you're one of their preferred customers, Target has you in a database buying diapers on a certain date which then they track that forward and go, oh, when you're six years old, you're going to need this. And they start marketing stuff to you based on that one purchase. Hmm. And that's, I mean, that's that's what they do. The whole Apple Pay thing was designed to try and get around that by, you know, making every single transaction use a different 
essentially credit card number, but because Google went straight to the source, uh, they can get all the data that they want and tie it back to the person. It's terrifying to me. <laughs> I'm reminded of something that happened recently on Amazon and I, you know, whatever. I'll give away this bit of information, I suppose. I'm a little embarrassed, but it's fine. I drive a 1995 Toyota Corolla because it runs great. It's actually gotten me across the country, back and forth across the country several times. But it's a 20-something-year-old car, and so pieces break. So I had to buy a door handle recently, and I bought it through Amazon. Got it super cheap. You know, really excited about one day taking my car apart so I can put the door handle on. <laughs> but here's the thing. I bought I bought this, you know, thing for a 1995 Toyota Corolla. All of a sudden, Amazon saying, hey, maybe you want this thing for a 2013 Jeep. And I'm like, are, are you just trying to fool me, Amazon, into thinking you don't know? Or do you really not know? Because if you really don't know... It kind of does my heart good that there's somebody out there who's like, oh, he likes cars. Maybe he would like this thing for some other car. <laughs> I kind of got to wonder, I got I to gotta ask, it, it seems to me that one of the easiest ways to fight this particular thing, and then you tell the story about Target, and I'm like, okay, well, that's kind of, okay, that is freaky. And of course, I don't really think Amazon, generally speaking, Amazon is not quite as stupid as that one story that I just told. I mean, we're leaving, you know, crumbs all over the place, but let's just talk specifically about this Google and, and MasterCard thing. The easiest way to fight this, theoretically, is sign out of Google when you're done, you know, with the Google services that you're using. Does anybody actually sign out of Google? And then follow-up question, can you be sure you've actually signed out of Google? Because, okay, I signed off on my computer, but I'm probably still on, on my phone and on, you know, my iPad and some other device as well. I mean, do you even pay attention to whether or not you're, quote, signed into Google? Or are you like a lot of people, myself included, just, you know, more often than not, without even realizing it, uh, still signed into Google? Yeah, I, I do keep track of whether or not I'm signed into Google or not. Hmm. Uh, but it's it's really, really hard because, you know, Google, because they're so user-friendly, uh, user-friendly, and by user-friendly, I mean, they want all your data. Um, <laughs> you know, the the difficult part is your work is probably using Google services. I mean, right now, uh, as we record this show, you know, we're looking at a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. um, the two of us are, are looking at it together. Um, and, and, and so you have to be signed in to use these things. And when you sign in with one account, Google will just very nicely tie it to your other accounts, right. um, which then means that it doesn't matter. You can go, oh, well, you know, I surfed using my work account. They'll never know that it was me. No, trust me, they know it was you. Uh, so that's where it becomes really, really difficult. And then when you start adding devices and you've got your work computer, with the, which is signed in, and your phone, which is signed in, uh, then it becomes really, really difficult to sort of divorce yourself from the tracking that Google does. It's uh, it's tough, at least to my mind, to argue that this benefits consumers unless you're going to make the case that, you know, the advertiser can focus more on selling relevant ads rather than ads that have no relevance. I know a lot of people who actually like that. They like when they get an ad that is, you know, geared specifically for something that they might need or want. I personally miss Speedy alka -Seltzer. I miss when ads tried to be, you know, interesting and engaging and really inform me. As opposed to like, you know, just painting a target on me. But that's, uh, hey, there's another mention of target, although it's a different one that time. <laughs> as far as the privacy part is concerned, Christine Bannon, uh, counsel with the advocacy group Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC, is quoted in the Bloomberg piece saying, people don't expect what they buy physically in the store to be linked to what they're buying online. There's just far too much burden that companies place on consumers and not enough responsibility being taken by companies to inform users what they're doing and what rights they have. Now, I should point out that while neither Google nor MasterCard were willing to talk about their partnership specifically, uh, both took pains to point out that they're not sharing information about specific individuals. It's kind of like you said a minute ago. It feels like that's only the case un until it's not the case, until <laughs> they decide to you know, change something. And as Epic's Ms. Bannon said, it'll be up to consumers to somehow magically know uh, that something has changed that they need to fix. Uh, uh, speaking of fixing, maybe you did know this. Uh, do you know or did you know before we started recording this show, August, uh, how to opt out of Google's ad tracking? Um, 
<laughs> uh, not specifically. Yeah. Uh, but, but what, what really, uh, makes me laugh is they bury these options so deep and make them so difficult to try and turn everything off that the only way to opt out of Google's ad tracking is to Google how to opt out of Google's ad tracking. Right. And then, <laughs> and then you actually have the problem that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I can't remember exactly what it was now, but basically there was a thing. Oh, it was the thing that was supposed to like eliminate your search history, wasn't it? They were supposed to eliminate your web history, and, and then, you know, you turn that off, and it turns out, oh, no, there are still plenty of ways. Oh, no, it was location. It was your location history, and it turns out there were still plenty of other ways that they were keeping track of it, and they're like, well, we told you how to turn it off, and we did, but we're still doing it anyway, but we're not doing it the way you thought. Uh, for people who want to know, by the way, uh, you can turn off ad tracking using Google's web and app activity online console. And I do wish you uh, good luck finding that, because oddly enough, it's not right on the front page of Google. Uh, inside Google, says Bloomberg, multiple people raised objections that the service did not have a more obvious way for cardholders to opt out of the tracking. That's according to one of the people to whom Bloomberg spoke. Um, four secret sources for this story, by the way, three of whom were reportedly involved directly in the talks between the two companies. revisiting a theme that we hit last week we talked about a bit of uh, tracking tech that people could put on phones or you know uh, devices of other people that had exposed the information of the people being tracked spy phone was the name of the app marketed to parents and employers that we talked about last week um, a piece from motherboard said the app left the data of thousands of its customers and information of the people they were monitoring unprotected online the data exposed included selfies, text messages, audio recordings, contacts, locations, hashed passwords, and logins, uh, Facebook messages, and other sensitive info. Now, while that piece said that spy phone was marketed to parents and employers, I was concerned about risks around a controlling husband or wife or boyfriend or girlfriend. Well, it turns out all we had to do was keep reading. Motherboard's actually been doing a series on such tracking applications called When Spies Come Home. They've run a couple of stories in the past week, one about the hacking of a spyware company that marketed to domestic abusers, so they sound like fun, and another about an app meant to track a child's communications that ended up leaving the children's pics barely protected online. According to the first piece, a hacker broke into the servers of The Truth Spy, which Motherboard calls one of the most notorious stalkerware companies out there, and stole logins, audio recordings, pictures and text messages, location information, and social media chats, among other data. Not surprisingly, the hacker chose to remain anonymous, though Motherboard was able to confirm his or her story. The hacker was quoted as saying, I control victims all over the world. I have admin access to the servers. The hacker says there are more than 10,000 The Truth Spy customer accounts, which means the possibility of holding sensitive data on 10,000 people, plus one assumes the people with whom they share whatever data they might have uh, been sharing they, that could leave them compromised. Criticizing the company, the hacker says they take care about how to spy, but not take care about how they secure the attacker's and victim's privacy. In this particular case, there's good news-ish, the hacker said he lost access recently when the Truth Spy updated its servers, but who knows who else had access to the data, how much of that data they downloaded, and what they did with that data if it was in fact stolen. Now, I will say I was confused by something in this piece. The motherboard piece said that the Truth Spy was an app that was sold for, or against, I guess you could say, Android and iOS. But how would that work on a non-jailbroken iPhone? So I reached out to Nicholas Totchak of Secure Mac, and he explained, saying usually the way it works is the person who wants to track somebody gets the iCloud login information, provides that information to the spyware company, then the spyware company uses that information to log into the iCloud backup system to download device backups, that extracts the data, messages, browsing history, photos, and so on, from that compromised iCloud account. So it's not an app on the iPhone but a service, and I put that in air quotes, a service that runs independent of the device. So here are the things that he suggested immediately. 
First of all, if you have a jailbroken iPhone, somebody can run spyware on it. So don't jailbreak your iPhone. Second, don't share your iCloud information with anybody. (laughs) And third, if you suspect that somebody has access, change your iCloud password. Now, I think that is an easier thing to do than it is to opt out of Google's uh, don't track me, bro, (laughs) control panel that lives someplace online. Do you happen to remember off the top of your head? I mean, you can actually just go into iCloud and change your password just right there, right? Yep. Uh, Yeah, just go into your account preferences and you can change the password. Yeah, there you go, which you can do on your iPad, your iPhone, your Mac, whatever. The only thing is, I mean, you have to know then the next time you go to your iPad and try to buy something, you're going to have to enter your new password or whatever. I mean, so. Yes. But I mean, that's a better thing than like the Google thing where it's like, well, I've logged out over here, but have I really logged out everywhere? Yes. If you change your iCloud password on your phone, your iCloud password is now changed. It's actually going to kind of annoy you the next time you go to rent a movie from Apple TV. <laughs> <laughs> And have to type but but password. you'll be much more secure. Exactly, which is obviously, you know, what we're talking about here. Now, as for the kids app, a known hacker tells Motherboard in the second story uh, that he was able to find the key and the cloud servers of Family Orbit, the company that markets itself as the best parental control app to protect your kids. According to the report, the hacker says that Family Orbit left the pictures of hundreds of monitored children online only protected by a password that almost anyone could find. I had all photos uploaded from the phones of kids being monitored and also some screenshots of the developers' desktops, which exposed passwords and other secrets, said the hacker. And by the way, Family Orbit has confirmed this breach. Once aware, a Family Orbit representative said, We have immediately changed our API key and login credentials. The sales and the services have been taken offline until we ensure all vulnerabilities are fixed. But if anybody else found and downloaded those pics before those changes, I mean, those pics are now officially who knows where being, <sighs> I don't want to think about the rest of it. I don't want to finish that sentence. Really, we're just reiterating a lot of what we said last week, right? I mean, just stuff that we've said on the checklist all the way back to this show's beginning. I, I mean, I, I not no spyware, no spyware. I mean, that's pretty <laughs> much it, right? <sighs> Man, if it were only that easy. But yes, that's that's all you need to do is don't do that. Right. That's a start at the very least. I mean, there are obviously other things that you need to do to, I mean, again, and it's like I said last week, I get why you want to do that to protect your kids. But here's the problem. What do you know about the place that's supposedly protecting your kids? If your kid is up to something terrible, and I certainly hope they're not, and I'm certainly not accusing your child of anything, (laughs) but if your concern is that your kid is doing something bad and you want photographic proof that your kid is doing something bad, the problem is other people may now have that photographic proof as well. And obviously, you want your kid to not be doing anything that's going to lead them into any sort of compromised situation But then just, you know, some other company that says, oh, well, we'll look into that for you. I got to go back to what I said last week. If your concern is your child, Checklist 24 is a great place for you to go. Five things to know about child-proofing your kid's iPhone. It was either 23 or 25 that was about child-proofing your kid's Mac. I mean, there are lots of things, especially for Apple users, there are lots of things that are built in to help you keep your child as safe as you possibly can introducing shadythirdparty.com into the mix <laughs> or even even straight up legit thirdparty.com because they may honestly think that they are keeping everything as safe as they possibly can. What do we know about what they know about keeping things safe? Sorry, I think I got, uh, you know, a tiny bit off on a rant. The other thing I will say, addressing <laughs> the jailbreaking thing really quickly, um, 999 out of a thousand times, and that's not scientifically proven, that's just me, Right. I use that ratio, uh, and that ratio may be smaller than that, but there is almost no reason to jailbreak an iOS device. I'm not going to say that there is never a reason to jailbreak an iOS device because absolutes make me uncomfortable. But for most people, the reason to jailbreak is outweighed by the hazards to which you leave yourself open. At least that is the feeling that I have had for a number of years, especially since the release of the App Store. And then certainly uh, talking to uh, the guys at the checklist, uh, that feeling that I've had for a number of years has just been reinforced. 
Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm really curious as to what legitimate uses for jailbreaking there are anymore. The App Store provides almost every app that you could possibly need. Um, if you're doing development work, uh, if you are doing some sort of specialized research, then maybe I can understand it. But, you know, if you're using, if you're jailbreaking your phone and for a legitimate reason other than, you know, uh, free Bitcoin, um, <laughs> email us and let us know because I'm, I'm genuinely curious as, as to what those uses are. Yeah. Cause I mean, cause here, here, both of us now, we're not saying there's no reason. <laughs> <laughs> we're just saying uh, we're not aware of them. So yeah, checklist at securemac.com is the email address. Uh, address address your email to August asked a question <laughs> or, you know, why I jailbreak if you want to. Uh, checklist at securemac.com. And if you don't have a pen to write that down now, well, it's a podcast, so you could pause it and grab a pen or you can hang on because we will give you that address again at the end of the show. It's been kind of a dark show, huh? <laughs> I guess it kind of, I mean, it, it can be from time to time. I'll tell you what we're going to do, though. Uh, we will light a candle in this accursed darkness in a moment. But first, a word about MacScan 3 from Secure Mac. You know, you could argue that I'm actually lighting a candle by talking about that as well. Because um, what MacScan 3 does is it scans your Mac for malware. And, and if you think, if you're listening to this show, I don't think you think this anymore, but remind friends that just having a Mac is not everything you need. You do need a good way to, you know, make sure that the stuff that you've downloaded, that the places that you're going, that your Mac is still running clean. Mac Scan 3 can help. It's a great defense against malicious software attacks aimed at your Mac. It's developed by Secure Mac, uh, the people behind the checklist, funny enough trusted names in computer security and developers of exceptional security software for the Mac for well over a decade. MacScan 3 detects and removes Mac malware, catches keyloggers, removes tracking cookies, and provides full range or targeted scanning, all without crowding up your hard drive or slowing down your computer. Say goodbye to worry and hello to the cushy comfort of security with MacScan 3 for Secure Mac. Sign up for a free 30-day trial today at securemac.com slash MacScan. That is MacScan3 by Secure Mac. Your 30-day free trial is waiting at securemac.com slash MacScan. I promised a bit of good news. I promised a bit of good news because I like the stories, you know, or at least the shows. Not every story has, you know, a positive spin. I like the shows, though, where we can provide a bit of good news, and, and we have a bit of good news to wrap up the day. Oh, what's the good news? The good news... <laughs> I feel like... Oh, I'm so close to telling you something inappropriate or saying something inappropriate, and instead, <laughs> I'm just going to say, uh, this is from TechCrunch, uh, the pro-privacy search engine DuckDuckGo has quietly picked up $10 million in fresh funding from Canadian pension fund Omer's VC arm. In a blog post announcing the investment, Omer's Ventures argues that privacy and security concerns have risen to the forefront of public consciousness over the past five years, noting how governments are responding to public demand and data breaches and starting to take real action, citing the European Union's updated privacy framework, GDPR, as one example. Now, this is only the second funding round for the 10-year-old company, which last picked up $3 million in VC funding all the way back in 2011. I found myself wondering how DuckDuckGo makes its money, and August, you are not going to believe this. DuckDuckGo makes its money through advertising. I don't believe it. Non-tracking advertising. See, that's the part you don't believe, I think, because, you know, <laughs> lots of people make money in advertising, but non-tracking advertising, and they've been profitable since 2014, and this sounds like an ad for them. I'm just more amazed that they've been able to do that. That is just really impressive. It is, it, it, Right? So, yeah, um, the piece says this was only the search engine's second round of funding, as I mentioned before. The other was for $3 million in 2011. Not only did they not need the cash from Omers, they actually didn't want it. They rebuffed the investment at first, though TechCrunch says Omers persisted and was able to persuade founder Gabriel Weinberg to take the money 
to help support growth objectives for DuckDuckGo, particularly internationally and including in Canada where the fund is based. So I, I like that. I like the fact that somebody who has who has who has, you know, planted their flag, they've staked their claim, they've literally made their money in saying we don't want to track people online, even though they could have made so much money so much faster if they had. Um now what's funny to me, they they happen to come up this week, and one of the reasons I wanted to point out this story is because it was a couple of weeks ago that I accidentally shamed you into switching from Google as your default search on your iPhone uh, to DuckDuckGo. And I'm curious, how has that DuckDuck gone? <laughs> well, <laughs> DuckDuck isn't gone. DuckDuck is still around. Okay. Um, because I do like it. I like it a lot. I- I'm I'm now a convert. Um, you know, I still have some kind of hangups, but they're more mental hangups than they are with the product itself. Um, the one thing that I like the most is that I am 95% sure that I am free from being tracked. Um, and the reason I give it 95 and not 100%, even though that's their business model, is that I'm always a little suspicious of everything. Um <laughs> Absolutes make so, you nervous as well. I understand exactly, exactly. But uh, but no, it's the the search results are different from Google, and sometimes I feel like I'm missing something. But at the same time, I'm seeing things that Google wouldn't return. Um, so I, I think there's you know it's just based on their algorithm. Each algorithm is different, and and what they prioritize and. Uh, you know, I I got to believe that there's probably some monkeying around with some of the search results at, at Google based on business objectives, and it doesn't seem to be that way with DuckDuckGo. Um, I'm curious then, have you switched in the rest of your computing life? Like if you sit down I, near Mac, do you go to Google or do you go to DuckDuckGo? I even, uh, well, I usually search through the, the search bar. Um, in the browser. So it's just automatic for me. But I even went so far as to switch over my wife's computer. Really? Okay. So wait, you've switched it on your Mac and you've also switched it on, on her computer as well. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> See, because here's what's funny. I was giving you grief about your iPhone. I've never switched it on my computer. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even occur to me until today. I'm like, why? Why is that exactly? I think it was partly. I think it was really just to sort of send a message to the man, the man being whoever you know, Tim Cook, or um, or whoever is the head of Google. I can't remember anymore because whatever. Um, but like when it became an option on my iPhone, I switched it on my iPhone. I want to say that day, and um, yeah, it just never even really crossed my mind. So tune in next week when I say. Hey, guess what I forgot to do last week? <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, that'll that'll be exciting. This whole thing started because I was going to give you grief, and it's going to end with you know you calling me at like two thirty one morning, going seriously, you have to switch, and maybe I will. <laughs> hey, that is our list checked for this week. But remember, uh, there is plenty more to explore from past episodes to deep links. Uh, the site to start for all of that securemac dot com slash checklist. You'll find notes there for today's show and every show that we've done before. And you can listen to all of those shows there as well. Uh, Checklist 24, the one about childproofing your kid's iPhone. The one before that or after that that's about childproofing your kid's Mac. Um, that's, that's two shows right there you can listen to. Then there's this one. And then there's 102 others. SecureMac.com slash checklist. If you have a question you'd like to ask or a topic you'd like to hear us hit, our email address is checklist at securemac.com. That address again is checklist at securemac.com. Don't forget August challenge, by the way. So you jailbreak your iPhone. Please tell us why. Checklist at securemac.com. And if you can't remember that, please do remember this. You're listening to The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week.